Ja, sehr geehrte Frau Ministerin Dr. Asta Fretschko, dear Professor Gertz and dear panel panelists um, from the universities of Ljubljana and uh, Frankfurt, yeah, dear audience here in the room and also the audience who is uh, looking at the um, streaming or the video later on, um, yeah, I would like to welcome here in, uh, on behalf of uh, the Presidium of Goethe University to this um, um, special event, Ideology Critique, today. My name is Ulrich Schielein. I'm a Vice President of the Goethe University and a Chief Information Officer. So we are extremely pleased to have this exciting meeting of philosophers um, yeah, talking, taking place on this old campus um, here in Bockenheim as part of um, the book fair and the um, program uh, yeah, of this year's Guest of Honor, uh, Slovenia. This is really a historically charged location. On the one side, here, Goethe University was founded 109 years ago, 1914, also a very um, exciting time with a lot of turmoils. And on the other side, very legendary lectures took place in this lecture hall during the years of 1968. 1968, yeah, it was a time of uh, social upheaval, um, and there was a, a great philosopher, yeah, after whom this lecture hall is named inofficially um, the Adorno Lecture Hall. The years around the 68 were marked yeah, by many upheavals and challenges. A young generation, yeah, led by students from this university, was preparing to challenge the establishment. The representatives of the so-called Frankfurt School, yeah, such as Adorno, Horkheimer, and even the young Habermas, provided important intellectual impulses for social change processes, even in passionate disputes with the student generation. And I think a lot of you remember the pictures uh, of the uh, occupied Institute for Sozialforschung and others. Yeah? 50 years later, we are facing challenges that are certainly seem at least as great, if not even greater, at that of that time. The rise of right-wing populist forces, a war in Eastern Europe, and, as of a few days ago, also in the Middle East. Plus climate change, plus migration challenge, plus, 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 just to name a few of the crises we are currently facing. So more than ever, there is really a need for a critical reappraisal of all these challenges. Today, right-wing and authoritarian movements adorn themselves with slogans that were actually once emancipatory in nature. Against this background, what can ideology critique still achieve today? How can a social theory penetrate our complex and contradictory times? I'm therefore excited about the lineup of today's panel representative of both schools, Frankfurt School and the uh, School of uh, Ljubljana of uh, Psychoanalysis. Representatives of this school formulated new views on communism and uh, liberal democracies from the late uh, 1970s on in an intensive debate with Marx, Hegel, and the psychoanalysis of Jacques Lacan, but also with the Frankfurt School. Ladies and gentlemen, at a time when crisis phenomena seem to be overflowing, when one-sided, distorted, and questionable interpretations of the world are sometimes conveyed, repeated, and copied in seconds worldwide through digital media and channels, there's really an urgent need yeah, for um, analysis that thinks out of the box, that makes use of various currents of thought and instruments to mentally penetrate the modern world and formulate new approaches. So I wish you all yeah, a very exciting um, panel discussion, yeah, an exciting two hours, and I'm looking forward, yeah, I will stay here and follow the discussions. Have a good evening. Your Excellency, Minister of Culture of Slovenia, Your Excellency, Ambassador, of Slovenia and Berlin, your excellencies who I could not name and could not identify, all my dear colleagues, all writers and poets, all philosophers, dear audience. I'm only speaking three sentences. 
as a curator appointed three years ago for the guest of honor efforts of Slovenia at this book fair 2023, my first idea was to bring this, uh, this meeting about Frankfurt School meets Ljubljana School. How even this formation is possible to call people Frankfurt School and Ljubljana School, we will see in the debate. And I will invite you now for exciting two hours, and I wish all of our panelists to just step on and start the debate. Please join me in welcoming all of our participants today, and this is a start. Thank you. Hallo, funktioniert das? Uh, hallo Ihnen uh, und euch allen. Mein Name ist Frank Ruder. Uh, ich bin Professor für moderne und zeitgenössische Philosophie in, an der Universität Dundee. Und ich werde jetzt gleich anfangen, Englisch zu reden, weil wir heute alle hier Englisch reden. Aber ich wollte zumindest die Begrüßungsworte in Deutsch uh, artikulieren uh, und mich deswegen aber nochmal wiederholen. Hello and good evening. My name is Frank Ruder and I'm Professor for Modern and Contemporary Philosophy at the University of Dundee. And I will moderate this evening's panel discussion that will address the tasks, potentials, potential limits and limitations and challenges embodied and confronted by different approaches to the critique of ideology under present day conditions that is in the contemporary world, if it still deserves this name. We have with us a group of illustrious speakers on this panel. And before I will briefly introduce all of them in a row, I want to give you a sense of what to expect from the coming two hours. We will, after I introduce each of them, hear um, from each of our speakers a seven-minute, I insist, introductory statement. I bought this thing uh, with me. Uh, I will turn it. They will all speak longer, but I wanted to make them feel guilty. <laughs> Afterwards, we will move through a series of themes that will highlight the dimensions and domains of contemporary ideology um, and how to conceive of it and its intricacies, which will uh, give all of our panelists the chance to react to each other's opening statement and explore overlaps and agreements, as well as distances um, and, or disagreements. And I will attempt to maneuver us through this in a more or less disciplined manner. We aim to also, at the end, um, have questions from the audience and open up the, the discussions. But now, to get started, let me introduce our speakers in the order in which they will present their introductory statements. To begin on my far left, Mladen Dola. He was professor for philosophy at the University of Ljubljana, where he works now as a senior research fellow, and he's professor of philosophy at the European Graduate School. His most recent book publications include the German, Die Phrenologie des Geistes, Fünf Aufsätze zur Philosophie Hegels, just out from Neue Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher and present at the fair, and his English, A Voice and Nothing More. Rainer Forst is Professor of Political Theory and Philosophy and Director of the Research Center Normative Orders here at the Goethe University Frankfurt. In uh, 2012, he was awarded um, um, the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize of the Res German Research Foundation. His most recent book publication in German is Die Numenale Republik from 2021, which is forthcoming with Polity Press and Normativity and Power from 27. Alenka Zupancic is Professor of Philosophy at the Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts and Professor of Philosophy and Psychoanalysis at the European Graduate School. Her most recent book publications include the German Was ist Sex, 
Psychoanalyse und Ontologie and Let Them Rot, Antigone's Parallax, which is out just this year with Fordham University Press. Regina Kreide is Professor for Political Theory and the History of Ideas at the Justus Liebig University, uh, University Gießen, member of the working group Democracy at the Berlin Brandenburgian Academy of Science in Berlin, and her most recent book publications include the German Globale Gerechtigkeit and the co-edited collection Conceptualizing Power in Dynamics of Securitization Beyond State and International System. Slava Zizek, don't get too bored, we're almost done, right? Um, is a senior uh, researcher at the University of Ljubljana, professor of philosophy of the European Graduate School, and international director of the Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities. His most recent book publications include The German, Die Paradoxien der Mehrlust, Ein Leitfaden für die Nichtverwirrten, just out and presented at the fair, and Freedom, a Disease Without Cure, also just out, I think, a few days ago. Martin Saar is professor of social philosophy here at the Goethe University, Frankfurt principal investigator at the Research Center Normative Orders and Board, and steering committee member of the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt. His most recent book publications include The Immanenz der Macht, Politische Theorie nach Spinoza, um, 2013 and reissued 2019, and the co-edited collection Das Politische in Brackets in der Politischen Theorie from 21. In preparation for this panel, so behind the scenes, so to speak, and in a world in disarray, I asked each panelist to respond to what theory can still do today by asking them to, uh, to respond to the question, and that is the inaugural question, is ideology critique still possible today? We will now hear the first reply from Laden Dula. Well, um, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, it's a mixed blessing of uh, seniority to be the first to speak, uh, not a dubious privilege. Um, seven minutes is very short, so let me, let me go on with it. Uh, we are to talk about a critique of ideology, the idea that, that has a venerable and particularly uh, history, and particularly pertaining to this spot, the Frankfurt School, and its viability in drastically changed historic circumstances. I will very briefly address two aspects of the transformation one dealing with the notion of uh, ideology in the time of uh, the emperor's new nudity. And I like this formulation, I borrow it from my friend Yuval Kremnitsa. And the other uh, dealing with the nature of the social bond at the time of the new media, the social media and what is meant by the term social nowadays. So the term ideology, uh, with the long history of critical theory stretching back to Marx, implies a structural deceit not just a delusion that has to be debunked, uh, so as we could see straight, but a false consciousness in Marxist parlance necessarily produced by a false world. So what is at stake is the critique of the world that needs ideology and is sustained by it. Ideology's biggest success is when it manages to present something as completely non-ideological, self-evident, objectivity itself, thus erasing the traces of its operation and the interests that are fueling it, ultimately its class nature. The critique aims at exposing the hidden springs of this operation, the way it's slanted at its core behind its facade. This constellation changed with the advent of new populisms in the last decade or two, with the new forms of obscenity of power, to make it quick. What is obscene? One can use the formulation proposed by Freud in his uh, designation of the uncanny, of das Unheimliche, Something comes to the fore that should have remained hidden. One sees something that shouldn't have been seen. To be sure, there was always an obscene side to power, the blunt self-interest behind the pretense of ideas. But if all this comes to the fore, are we finally seeing its truth, uncovered, unveiled, without dissimulation? Anything but. Quite the contrary. What we see is just another lure, actually a more insidious lure, a meta-lure, as it were. Obscenity is the way in which the very unveiling starts functioning as a veil. It seems that the critique of ideology has a great rival with the likes of Donald Trump. The figure of self-exposure is the word, but Trump is just a shorthand for so many things. There seems to be no need for convoluted interpretations, sophisticated conceptual means developed by the critique of ideology to debunk the subtle fallacies behind the facade. It is as if the object of analysis would itself present its own critique, 
by exposing it, its hidden side in the face of the hapless critics of ideology. It's like ideology unmasking itself, lifting the veils. The emperor may take off all his clothes. A people may cry, the emperor is naked, pointing out the obvious, but to no avail. And even more, the emperor may proud, proudly, proudly cry out, look, I'm naked. Thus, being always in advance of the outraged critics. To the point of a caricature, and indeed the new leaders have been often qualified as clowns and buffoons, to the point that Terry Gilliam of Monty Python fame said that Trump is funnier than anything that Monty Python could imagine in their wildest days. But the laughter kind of gets stuck in the throat. Um, this has like the structure of the Freudian joke, the famous Freudian uh, meta joke. Here. Why are you demonstrating to me that power is obscene when I know full well that power is obscene, so why are you lying to me? This is a new term I'm trying to briefly pinpoint. The mechanism by which lifting the illusion actually heightens and enhances the illusion. The lifting of the veil turns into the most obdurate veil. The utter offuscation coincides with the coming out of the hidden. And Freudianly speaking, this may look like lifting the repression with the most childish and primitive impetuses coming to light. But it's the very opposite. The repression itself gets repressed. And this may be one of the simple diagnoses, one of the diagnoses qualifying the present moment, the astounding degree to which the repression itself can get repressed. The other aspect I can bring up very briefly concerns the social media, which is which are the last avatar of the mediatization of the world through the last century. Like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter emerged around 2006, Instagram in 2010. They're all very recent phenomena, and it's rather staggering that 15 years on, we cannot imagine our public and private lives without them. I think it's unprecedented in human history that vast masses of people, possibly the majority of world population, including public services and politicians, moved voluntarily by their own accord, a massive proportion of their private and public activities, to very few privately owned platforms based on undisclosed algorithms and subject to massive mechanisms of surveillance, commercial exploitation, and manipulation. This has greatly affected what Kant called the public use of reason, which was the major weapon of the Enlightenment. The space of the public use of reason was based on a series of oppositions which are now in danger of collapsing. And to make it short, seven of them. First, the opposition with the, uh, between private and public, and blatantly so after the Twitter presidency, which normalized the way the public affairs are now massively conducted over platforms. Second, the, division between, the divide between knowledge and opinion. The philosophy famously started by drawing a sharp line between doxa and episteme, the regime of opinions and of knowledge, based on logos. Third, the opposition between relevant and irrelevant, increasingly drowned by the mass of information. Fourth, between information and knowledge. Information is instant. Knowledge demands labor and time. Fifth, between verified and unverified. Sixth, between decent and indecent. The massive flow of communication allowing for the normalization of indecency, contravening against the basic tenets of what Hegel called the Sittlichkeit. And seventh, between producer and consumer. We are all constantly producers and consumers of messages and images, which turns us simultaneously into exhibitionists and voyeurs. But with the collapse of these seven divides, there is one divide that doesn't collapse and gets enhanced, which is the class divide. So the previous mass media, uh, press, radio, TV, have been overshadowed by this new avalanche, which now sets the tone. To be sure, the old media were far from blameless. A lot of critique was devoted to the massive manipulation of the, in the mediatization of society during the previous century. But this story has always already started. One can recall that the death knell of Logos was already sounded by Plato with the invention of writing. All new technologies were invariably accompanied by predictions of gloom, with technophobia accompanying philosophy as its shadow. One can say that the decline of Logos is as old as Logos itself. Still, the recent development seems to bring this to an unprecedented level. The new quantity concerning speed, global reach, the sheer mass of communication may well spell in qualitatively different setup. 
Lacan introduced the notion of the big other as a handy shorthand for the assumption of a guarantee subtending language and enabling discourse. And one could sum up all this by saying that nothing any longer carries the stamp of the big other. And I can sum up finally by saying that uh, there is the paradox of this time. The paradox of this time is that the more there is information, and there has never been so much information readily available in all history, the less there is knowledge. And the more there is communication, and there has never been so much communication in human history, the more there is the danger that the fabric of the social ties may fall apart. If information and communication were supposed to be the two basic functions of language and social bonds, then they are around in such massive quantities as never in history. There is an overkill of them. There is an overkill of what used to be the dream of the Enlightenment, freely available information and free communication. And being here in Frankfurt, I guess this pessimistic diagnosis follows the best tradition of Adorno. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, you see, it worked. Seven minutes, 45, uh, 45 seconds of good. Um, so we will, hear, <laughs> we will hear next from Rainer Forst. I, I rushed through it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. To, uh, thanks to Matthias Göritz, Miha Kovac, uh, and to you, Frank, for bringing us together here this evening. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here with three, um, these three colleagues from Ljubljana and um, and my two friends here from Frankfurt. The question of whether ideology critique is still possible today, I think is, is not as artificial as those of you who would immediately say yes may think. I will also say yes, but it takes some reflection of eight and a half minutes. No, well, we'll see. Some who are skeptical think that we live in an age where ideology critique is dead. In the Marxist tradition, ideology is defined as objectively necessary false consciousness. And that idea of necessity seems to imply a questionable form of historical determinism. And many today doubt that the terminology of false versus true or real interests can be philosophically grounded. Others think that we live in an age of such obvious falsity and Mladen spoke about this, that the most aggressive ideologies today are not ideologies in the classical sense, as they do not even pretend to contain general truth claims. They ignore facts, construct false worlds, and happily fabricate their own truths. Adorno argued, for example, that with respect to Nazism, ideology critique was not appropriate, as such a regime doesn't really claim to realize some form of rational truth. I recognize these points, but I don't quite agree with the conclusions. I think that we have to hold on to a form of ideology critique that replaces assumptions about true interests with the normative notion of non-rejectable claims to moral and political standing as equals. So I think that is a normative standard we should hold on to. And I think that rationally deconstructing false worlds, including totalitarian ones, is a major task for critique today. Otherwise, we will not be able to analyze and criticize what I call normative verkehrung, normative inversion or perversion as a form of ideology. What do I mean? Define ideology shorthand uh, for pocketbooks uh, as justifying the unjustifiable. That's what ideologies do. Ideologie ist Rechtfertigung, as Adorno argues uh, in the text on Ideologie Kritik, I think all of us will, will uh, refer to. Further, realize what power is. Power really is exercised in the realm of justifications. Exercising power, whether ideological or not, means to make others think or do what they would otherwise not have thought or done. I call that, I call power a noumenal phenomenon, to speak paradoxically, but only seemingly, I hope. And like Foucault, I think that power is exercised over free subjects. If I handcuff you 
and drag you away. I use physical force with respect to you. But if I exercise power over you, I make you act and think in a way I want. So that's the difference between force and power. And to do that, I have to influence, determine, maybe even colonize the space of reasons that you operate, that you operate in. And how I do that, whether by a threat you find serious, a good recommendation, a great speech, an ideological lie, or a seduction, is a different matter. These are all forms of exercising power. If I exercise power over you, you remain an agent, right? There's something going on in the space of reasons you operate um, with. When I say space of reasons, I don't mean to push the affective or emotional out. I think the separation between affect and cognition is a, an artificial uh, separation. If desires motivate us, as they do, they motivate us because they have an evaluative point. So there's a cognitive aspect here, and I think the work of the Ljubljana School shows us very well how this work, uh, plays out, especially in the products of what the Frankfurters called culture industry. Now, I think that we live in an age of hyper-ideology as a form of normative perversion. Hyper, not mainly, though that is important, what Mladen said, because of the new quality of the digital production of us as justificatory subjects, subjects who believe in certain justifications for what it means to be a good citizen, a good student, a good professor, a good girl, a good German, and so on. What I mean is a real Umwertung der Werte, to use Nietzsche's term. Such perversion goes to the heart of our social existence as it distorts our thinking on the ground. We thereby lose the power of justification. Here I think I go beyond what Adorno thought ide ideology does, he, because he thought that it falsely pretends that valid normative principles are realized, and I say that ideology transforms the very terms in which we think about our reality. Where am I? All right. Okay. Can, I, can I switch on? <laughs> This means that, to give you a few examples, freedom gets identified with self-absorbed arbitrariness so that, in the COVID crisis, not wearing a mask is freedom, while being asked to wear it is, un is unfreedom and not a free act of responsibility. Economic freedom means being able to use one's privileges to make others truly unfree, but for their unfreedom, the word freedom is no longer available. That's how ideology works. It reevaluates a, a term and gives it a meaning that produces its opposite. Democracy, ideally the practice of justification among equals, is transformed into a means of domination for groups, sometimes shouting, the vice president alluded to it, wir sind das Volk, who form majorities to deny the human rights of others, who lose their means of subsistence or worse, their life by drowning in the Mediterranean. Justice gets reduced to the compensation of some of the worst forms of exploitation, which is a good thing if you compensate for that, but the structural injustice that led to that is being left in place nationally as well as transnationally and so on. Uh, equality is presented as equality of opportunity, but the extreme inequality that, the, that people have at their disposal, the resources they have to seek opportunities, is not, is not thematized. In the reservoir of ideologies, such re-evaluations use powerful resources that go back to historical narratives of justification that produce anti-Semitism, other forms of racism, of sexism, of the collective devaluation of groups singled out as non-equals or worse, as humans of a lesser, of lesser nature. These resources get activated in concrete settings, and we see this at work in many places, especially in contemporary contexts of extreme violence, 
In Russia today, we witness a feast of ideology where a brutal war launched on Ukraine is justified as an act of anti-fascist liberation, citing historical justice claims. We see it in another extreme form in Israel, where a vicious attack by Hamas on civilians who got slaughtered is defended and even celebrated as an anti-colonial act of resistance aiming at emancipation. Ideologies constantly are come to jump one more sentence, produce justifications of the unjustifiable, and they grow with the challenges of the time, if they are productive, and many of them are. What could not be justified becomes the dominant standard of justification, which is a perversion of reason. Regression is often the result of this, not just some form of regress, Rückschritt, but more seriously, a, a loss of the sense of being equals to each other, turning social facts of domination into normative facts. The true crises of our time, I think, are such justification crises where we forget what is justifiable and what is not. Emancipation comes in steps if things go well, steps in which we realize what we actually are and yet are rarely allowed to be, normative authorities equal to each other. The program I'm suggesting holds on to a strong version of what Adorno called the Rechtsanspruch der Vernunft, the authority of reason, and to standards of truth, the Anspruch of Wahrheit, without which any talk about ideology became itself ideological. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rainer. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Alenka Tupancic. Please, Alenka. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my statement is also a kind of attempt at the direct res response to your question. Is ideological critique still possible today? So I would say that uh, today ideology critique is above all necessary. It is imperative. But whether it is possible is another question. Actually, two questions. One more abstract or theoretical, and the other very, very concrete. The theoretical question concerns the debates between different schools of thought, such as, for example, the debate that Bruno Latour instigated with his provocative text, has critique, why has critique run out of steam? Uh, the text dates from 2004, which was a very different time from now. What has come to the fore in recent years is something, I think, very different and relatively new. Ideology critique, which for a long time had carte blanche in academia, to the extent precisely that many considered it inconsequential, incapable of changing anything, and in that sense impossible or simply useless, this same ideology critique is now becoming impossible in a much more concrete and practical sense, inadmissible bent sometimes, especially with respect to a certain number of so-called sensitive topics. Just one random example, a text by Franz Fanon was deemed inadmissible to be put on the reading list of a university seminar because he uses wordings that are seen as racist, even though Fanon entire Fanon's entire argument aims at and deconstructing precisely the semantics and the functioning of this wording. The analysis and putting things in some context are increasingly impossible, again, in some cases, judged guilty of relativization, if not of direct endorsing of the practices that are being analyzed. Or more precisely, we are asked to take into consideration some context, but to exclude others, often in the name of respect precisely of the first context. So these things are quite complicated. Further, words are used and understood very often, very frequently today, in a way that deliberately blocks all thought and speaks only to the emotions. Actually, we like to complain about the increasing use of emoticons instead of words. But the other side of this is perhaps even more worrisome, which is that words themselves are being used more and more as emoticons. 
not as something that is part of the differential structure of language and obtains its meaning through this network. Rather, they function often as in magical thinking through a direct um, meaning and contamination. You pronounce it, you are dirty, regardless of what you say about it. And this bizarre immediacy of words is like, I would say, ideology in its pure state. It puts an end to all thinking, all debate, all possibility of a real change. When I speak of the impossibility of saying certain things, of using certain words, I'm not speaking of freedom of speech, but rather quite literally about the impossibility of doing so. I'm struck by how often I hear intellectuals these days say things like, uh, never in my life have I been so afraid to say what I think, to discuss certain topics, use certain words. Of course, we are still officially free to do it, but something like an insidious inner monitor stops us. One could say that this is a privilege. It is a privilege to know only this kind of fear. Yes, I agree. Perhaps, yet not, this is not the point. If we take the word think in a strong sense, and not just a synonym for opinion, for expressing one's feelings and views, then perhaps not. Thinking is something else than simply messaging to others what you feel about this or that. It implies engaging, involving others in and with your thinking which is why not being able to say what you think to others, especially those who don't necessarily agree with you in advance, soon becomes indistinguishable from not being able to think, period. Again, this is not simply about freedom of rights, or freedom and rights, sorry. There are a few things that I despise more than people who openly attack, insult, denigrate other people, other races or sexual orientations evoking the freedom of speech card and feel all the more heroic, the more outrage they provoke. No, these people are not freedom fighters, even if they like to see themselves that way. They supposedly dare to say what they think, but thinking has very little place in all this. But when you say something like, never in my life have I been so afraid to say what I think, it also means that perhaps this can be the very moment when thinking and articulating what you think matters most. Many things that happen these days really surprise us. Our recent social existence is riddled throughout with totally unexpected things that happened, um, uh, that happen. Most of the things that happened in the past decade or so were declared a huge surprise. But when we stop to think about them, they, of course, become less surprising. This does not mean that we establish a smooth linear causality, explain away the surprise, or justify anything. No, a psychoanalysis teaches us causality is never simply a closed chain. Lacan put it very well, il n'y a de cause que de ce qui cloche. There are only causes of what does not work, of what stumbles and points to a gap, a leap, a problem. This is when we ask about causes. causes. So thinking is not about explaining away the surprise and making everything look natural. That is the job of ideology, precisely. Thinking is about establishing, locating this gap in causality this glitch, this point of decision where responsibility, agency, and yes, politics also come into play. And where things can or could have taken a different direction. So I would conclude by this statement, we need thinking, we need analysis. Not as an unnecessary complication, but as something absolutely vital, bringing in life, air to breathe, instead of surrendering to the suffocating immediacy of the obvious and of the given. But it doesn't end with thinking. Perhaps the real accomplishment is to say publicly and in a concrete context, not the most radical thing you can think of, not even exactly what you think, but to say, articulate something, the thing that makes a difference. 
that makes all the difference, perhaps, and opens new possibilities, new kind, new set of choices. And I would say that this is true art, art of literature, art of poetry, but also art of philosophy, and it is their power of intervention as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alenka. We'll, we'll next hear from Regina Kade. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this. I will, yeah, I see the, uh, the clock. Time is running. And uh, I would like to answer the question as well, even though I start with offering you here three points. And two of them deal with the question, what is ideology? So I think to answer this very difficult question, how ideology critique, is possible, and I think yes, it is. I'll say something what ideology means uh, today. And that's also not an easy answer to give. I think, first of all, ideology is a great simplifier, but it's a simplifier with a purpose. The deceit nature of ideology is the plausible deception that has us firmly in its grip. But why is it so deceptive? Ideologies, and we speak in plural here, I think it's no longer the case that we can speak about the one and only ideology, but there are many out there. Um, neoliberalism, racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, um, and um, so on. The description leaves untouched the most important parts of social reality in which it, the pre, uh, prevailing heterogeneity or the contradictoriness that's difficult for many to bear, that's, I think, one problem, repelled by the side of the other, by the side of what threatens to escape its own closed system by the new description of the world, ideology reduces the other to its own image, to something similar, to um, sometimes very easy uh, romanticizing, sometimes brachial answer. Um, Adorno said to cite, uh, if the lion had consciousness, human consciousness, it rage at the antelope it wants to eat would be ideology. So ideology homogenizes the world by unjustifiable equating phenomena that are different from one another. So that's the first aspect of it. But ideology, I said, is a great simplifier, but with a purpose. And what's the purpose? Ideology is not simply an illusion that we have developed by pure chance, I think, but it comes from our reality, from within, from our society, and fulfills a certain function in it, namely, to ensure that existing power relations are reproduced without us questioning them or trying to change them. So that's, I think, one aspect of it. So as an example, um, we live in neoliberal times and that means to uh, have a certain idea of freedom that's uh, purpose-related freedom that focuses on the individual and the responsibility of the individual. And that means that this is a part of the ideological idea that we should probably not question. However, secondly, ideology is paradoxically, to again speak here with Adorno, it's paradoxically true and false at the same time. The nature of ideology is the plausible deception that has us firmly in its grip, I said. By why is it so deceptive? Because ideology does not simply deceive. I mean, that would be too easy. It's not a simply deception that makes us believe something false about the real condition about which it's only necessary to enlighten. So that we could say, you know, if we have the good arguments, then we would see what's behind the scene. But it's more complex. It is paradoxically true and false. It's affirmative and critical at the same time. But how can that be? 
Um, for the existing world, a transcendent God, Yahweh, a, a transcendent idea, justice or freedom or a principle, purity, it's very often purity, homogeneity, <laughs> nirvana, is extracted and transferred into a second completely different, perfectly just and happy world, which abruptly contradicts the first, this side unhappy and unjust, the negative of the good world. At this moment, the existing contradictions of society between rich and poor, between freedom and unfreedom, security and insecurity, become an ideological reality. So they are part, they become part of our reality. So they are true on one side and nevertheless false on the other. In this way, there is a, a, a certain effect of those ideological thinking. It's allowed to postpone into the future the solution of pressing legitimacy problems like climate change impacts like war or racism. So that's intractable in our neoliberal, late capitalist, imperial-minded world. And it's to stabilize the tarnished legitimacy by gaining time to wait for the true freedom or the real right political leadership towards autocracy. So it's gaining time to you know, not solve, actually, the problems which are part of our existing society. So that's the function. And yet ideology is false. You can see this if you just look into people's heads and analyze what they think. This is one idea of ideology. But it's much better to look not just in people's heads, what they think, but how the nature of such relations determine the thinking and vice versa which performance ideology performs in that. Then one sees the social contradictions that are difficult to bear. For example, um, economic promise of freedom in our world, the freedom, the economic freedom, which turns into the hyper-controlled spreading of poverty and wealth, the futile individual responsible for areas of life, like healthcare, old age, and so on. What is the time? I have figured. And third, and yes, ideology critique is possible. And if you think about what then would be a possible way to criticize these ideologies aspects I have uh, addressed, then one can say, well, if we live in a permanent state of deception, who can ever look behind the scenes? who can expose the false promises. There are many ideologies, but little ideology criticism at the moment. Ideology critique is the attack on these deceptive reasons, but how? How is that possible? If at all, only, I think, the dialectical development of the contradiction existing in law in economy, politics, morality, allows to descend the whole in such a way that, again, for example, freedom, the whole wild, lawless freedom, today those people call themselves libertarians, is preserved. It's about the aggregation, the transference of a certain idea that we need to keep in a way of wild freedom or of public reason in the famous threefold sense of Hegel, the annihilation of libertarian freedom, the preservation of freedom, and third, then transforming that into a higher democratic level of development of equal liberty for everybody. Last sentence. Thus, the same freedom remains on all three levels, the equal freedom of one and everyone in its contradictions. And in order to realize this freedom, it's not a matter of disciplinizing or civilizing freedom or the move for justice, but solely of its equality. The historically 
highly variable equal use that everyone must be able to make of it. And it's much more complex, but we'll have time to discuss that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Regina. Um, now uh, it's Slava Zizek. Thank you very much. Let me begin with a surprising statement. I will make a very critical remark, friendly, about what happened here at the beginning. Our Minister of Culture, Asta Vrecko, was addressed, as you know, her excellency and that bullshit. No, I'm <laughs> proud to have her here because before she made the fatal mistake of going, becoming a minister, she is a serious theorist, one of us. So I'm proud to have her here, not because she is some bullshitting excellency, <laughs> but she is one of us who, by mistake, has to carry this bullshit of excellency now. <laughs> so please, yes, yes. Now uh, comes a very dark moment with which maybe you will not agree, but it's provocative. If there is a lesson to be learned from the latest right populist protests, is that, and it makes me infinitely sad to say this, is that the time has come maybe to turn around what Abraham Lincoln once said, you know. You can fool all people some of the time and some people all the time, but you can never fool all people all the time. I think that today's version is rather. Most people can avoid being fooled some of the time. Some people maybe can avoid being fooled all the time, but most people can never avoid being fooled all the time. <laughs> A genuine emancipatory engagement of the people is, let's be frank, and if anything, people like Adorno were fully aware of it. Uh, a rare event which unfortunately quickly disintegrates. So I don't trust those radical emancipatory moments like Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution when millions of intellectuals were sent to, uh, to among the farmers to learn some substantial, authentic truth. Now, I'm not saying that we intellectuals know it. R there, I'm just saying that in today's radical mess, we cannot impute to any social agent, unfortunately, some privileged access to authentic truth, like go to them and you will learn how things really are. Now, uh, quoting to both of you, uh, referring to, sorry, I will say, does this mean the end of ideology critique? No, quite the opposite. It means that we have to get rid of this deeply ingrained common sense idea, we intellectuals are in some, uh, in some uh, uh, ebony tower up there and you just need contact with sane, ordinary people to get at it. No, even ordinary people need a spontaneous, simplified form of ideology. Everybody needs it now. We cannot anymore relate to some traditional wisdom. If you don't believe me, take abortion. Avoid a misunderstanding I totally am for. What I'm just saying is that you have to make a decisions like when does life begin, blah, 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 which, sorry, are not part of any popular traditional wisdom. So how to do this? I'm very sorry, some of you will know what I'm saying now. I will just condense my old jokes, but I think it's crucial to do it. My perfect example of how uh, fetishism, fetishist disavowal, Verleugnung, if you are Freudians, not Verneinung, uh, of belief works in ideology. 
You know my favorite story, I believe Niels Bohr read Kierkegaard and so on, uh, is that a friend visited him, uh, him in his dacha, country house, and saw a horseshoe above the entrance to his house, and said, but aren't you a scientist? Do you believe in this superstitious, uh, sorry, superstitious bullshit? You know that a horseshoe presents evil spirits to enter the house. You know what Niels Bohr answered? For this, he is the classic of critique, ideology critique. Of course, I don't believe in it, but I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> That's ideology today. What do I mean by this? Another old joke. Already decades ago, a classic joke circulated among my band, Lacanians. You know, know it. A man who believes himself to be a grain of seed is taken to the mental institution where the doctors do their best to finally convince him that he is not a grain of wheat, but a man. However, when he is cured, convinced that he is not a grain of seed, but a man, and allowed to leave the hospital, he immediately comes back trembling of scare. Uh, he said, there is a chicken out there, and he was afraid that the chicken will eat him. Dear fellow, says him the doctor, but you know very well you are not a grain of seed, but a man. Of course I know that, replies the patient, but does the chicken know it? <laughs> this is how, quite literally, ideology functions today. And here I see the actuality of the best known passage in Marx, which many people quote, but nobody reads in detail. You know, uh, uh, at the very beginning of the famous uh, subdivision four of chapter one of Capital, the fetishism of commodity and its secret, Marx says the following. Listen carefully. A commodity appears at first sight an extremely obvious, trivial thing. But its analysis brings out that it is a very strange thing abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. Are you aware what Marx is saying here? The exact opposite of our vulgar idea, even of Marxism, that theological niceties are our subjective confusions. We have to look at reality the way it is. No, Marx says in our everyday awareness, we think reality is out there, simply there. Theological niceties are part of our, and I think uh, if I refer to others here, uh, 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 they already also pointed this. Uh, ideology today is not so much part of our awareness, it is uh, fully integrated into our reality itself. A typical, as Marx knew it well, bourgeois individual is usually not a Hegelian metaphysician. He is a totally sane British utilitarian, haha, there are just uh, real things out there who, but when he is socially active, he acts as, as if he believes. So we can easily imagine the same joke applied to Marx. Let's say I'm caught in commodity fetishism. I go to a critical Marxist psychiatrist who tells me, uh, no, but you know, uh, uh, there is no, uh, uh, that, that, uh, a commodity fetishism is just an effect of social relations and so on. And then I run out and uh, can, uh, go leave the, and come back uh, claiming, uh, 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 of course, I, uh, I encountered a commodity, I'm in a panic. Then the doctor tells me, but don't you know commodity is just an effect of social relations? My answer is, of course I know it, but does the commodity know it? <laughs> Marx says this literally, read Capital in detail, when at the beginning of uh, 
at the beginning of, uh, 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 sorry, in the middle of chapter one, his crucial theoretical twist is introduced by words, and it's crucial. Imagine two commodities speaking with each other. Of course, this is an illusion, but you see my point. I will not bore you by, I hope you know them, by my even more vulgar old joke you know. Your German toilets, they are German metaphysics, no? Do you still have toilets like this, where the, the, the sheet is displaced there and you go through your dirty rituals, you smell it, blah, blah? <laughs> French, French toilets, revolutionary. Hole in the back, flush disappears. English toilets, British, utilitarian. Sheet flows there a little bit. Sorry, I spoke with many architects and so on, and they told me there is no explanation. It's everyday ideology at the most vulgar level. Now, to conclude, yeah, uh, you know uh, what this means, what others already hinted, that we live effectively in an era of cynical reason. But one step further from Sloterdijk. Sloterdijk did a nice thing when he turned around this. Sie wissen das nicht, aber sie tun es, as you know, into. Sie wissen sehr wohl, was sie tun, aber dennoch sie tun das. Now, I am always male chauvinist stealing, especially from women. Alenka made in a text a wonderful distinction here. She said, uh, fetishist Verleugnung is not just the standard, je sais bien, mais quand même. I know how things are, but nonetheless, I unconsciously of what believe. No, what makes me really sad today is that, and don't be too afraid, this is my one, one before the last concluding <laughs> moment, or to put it in your cynical terms, I will have just two sentences more to say, but they are like sentences in Kant's Critique der Reinen Vernunft, you know what? Uh, sorry. Let me go quickly on. You know what is today ideology? That's why if I were to be a terrorist, I would first put a bomb into, uh, into uh, Venice, Venegedic, and Castle Biennale. I always read their programs. It's one big anti-capitalism. We are colonized, Europe is the worst, we are blah, blah, blah. As such, they fit perfectly, cannot fit better today's global capitalist market. Mark my point here. I'm not just saying that in spite of this self-criticism they fit. No, it's because through this self Criticism. And now, really, the last sentence, since there were some unfortunate ambiguities about what I said uh, two, three days ago, here, not only scientific analysis of ideology, but philosophical reflection is needed. My, really, uh, concluding point. Uh, look, let's take anti-Semitism. Imagine we are here in Germany, maybe not in Frankfurt. From what I know, Frankfurt was not the worst anti-Semitic. And I am debating with some true anti-Semite. The moment I accept the debate simply at the level of facts, I've sold my soul to the devil. Because, listen, he will tell me, but Jews control too many media, journals, critique. I don't know if it's true, but maybe to a some point it was true. I don't know. He will tell me, but Jews are seducing German girls. My answer would be, I hope so, and other, yeah, also the other way around, and so on. Then the conclusion will just be, okay, the both sides are each exaggerating, the truth is somewhere in the middle. No, the key reflexive question is not, is what the Nazis are claiming true? We should also clarify this, yes. But the true question is, 
Why do the Nazis need something like the figure of a Jew to assert their identity? That's the problem. Why do they need a Jew? Here, thinking begins. Vielen Dank, Genossen und Genossinnen. Thank you. How much did I get? Uh, two, three. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Slavo. It, it didn't work, well, it didn't go that bad. Um, and so the final um, statement is from Martin Zapp. Why was I obliged to sit in and he can stand up? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> so, good evening. Speaking after Slavo Zizek. <laughs> I'm sorry for this anticlimax. <laughs> and it gets even a little bit worse, because I will not answer Frank Ruda's question directly, but will proceed in a school-like, academic, even dogmatic manner. Because for me, thinking about ideology critique today and in the future means thinking about its possibility in the history of the Frankfurt School or the critical theory itself. So my question is, what was ideology critique in one of the seminal texts of this tradition which might open up a couple of trajectories for thinking about it today. One of the canonical instances of this reflection in the tradition is, many of you know it, Adorno's Beitrag zur Ideologienlehre, a contribution to the doctrine or theory of ideology from 1954. And what I propose is a mini, mini reading of this. And I think this might guide us in also thinking about some problems today. I have three points. The first, Adorno urges us to treat the problem and the concept of ideology to be historical in nature, expression and reflection of their own time and conditions, making it necessary to distinguish pre-bourgeois from bourgeois ideologies and times and adapt the schema to contemporary, this is 1945, 54, conditions. There is a time when it was absolutely crucial to demand the realization of particular values like freedom and equality, and a time when it was sufficient to show that these promises had been made but broken. But there's also a time where there's not even the pretense of aspiring to realize them anymore, where inequality and domination are so blatantly visible, not concealed but manifest, that there is not even a specific ideology that would try to manifest this. And this is what Adorno thinks is true in 1954. So this historicity of the problem of ideology might make us suspicious whether it remains an adequate concept for social critique. This is Adorno's position. Distracting from the real problems, namely a social and political world that has practically, materially unleashed the sheer force of class domination, social discipline, and psychic submission. In Adorno's words, the social totality itself has become untrue, a systemic, as you know, Verblendungszusammenhang, for which specific ideological moments might be functional by not essential. And this might mean that, for example, analyzing neoliberalism as an ideology is not the full story. Ideolog uh, neoliberalism is much more. It's a practical functioning system and a mode of government. It does not even conceal or manipulatively lure subjects into obedience without knowing it. It operates through sheer coercion. Second, Adorno attacks bourgeois theorists of ideology, like Pareto and some contemporaries, but also Scheler and Mannheim, for ultimately remaining committed to a subjectivist conception. This error for Adorno at the time is the signature of bourgeois thinking, and it has far-reaching consequences for the study of ideology, which must not, in his sense, be watered down to the study of Weltanschauungen or public opinion. Rather, Adorno already claims in 54, following up on his own explorations of culture industry from a decade earlier, means analyzing consumer culture, not political programs, advertisement, not elaborate speeches, and also villages, images, visual culture, as we might say, because they have become the main carriers or generators of the subjective and psychological energies used and instrumentalized for domination and submission. It is these realms that are thoroughly objective, namely following the imperatives of capitalist economy and consumer culture, that are mediated, experienced, lived in the daily life of subjects 
who don't hold grand ideas about the nation, about history, or the common good. This is the stuff of Weltanschauungen, but they care about their own well-being, their authenticity and enjoyment, and this is here where contemporary ideologies lie and operate. This thesis about the change of locality of ideology or of the sectoral displacement of ideology from the programmatic into the everyday to me seems far-reaching, and it's also challenging the philosophical task to contribute to ideology critique today. If Adorno is right, philosophers, like us, I fear, cannot not be also cultural critics, critics of culture, media, and thinking far beyond the safe space of texts, ideas, and books, which might remain relevant, but not the main site of struggle. As to contemporary critical theory in the Frankfurt sense, just note that Jürgen Habermas, in his early 90s, two years ago, felt the need to actualize or update his own thesis about the structural transformation of the public sphere. He did this, I think, with exactly that sense of urgency to assess the current system of the production and circulation of ideas, news and images, that only bears a faint resemblance to the one he was describing in his groundbreaking books from 1961. Third, Adorno urges us to rethink the task and the goal of ideology critique, given these historical shape shifts and structural transformation. In his diagnosis, ideology and reality have moved towards each other to the point of merging, this is a quote, and reality, in the absence of any other convincing ideology, becomes ideology of itself. These are phrases from the last paragraph of the 1954 text. If this is the case, philosophy does, only, does not only have, the, have to point to the untruth in necessarily false consciousness, this is still urgent, but somewhat easy, even facile, since the untruth of the whole, the entire system, is so blatantly manifest. In the current world, Adorno says in 54, to point out this shine or semblance of the state of the world only requires, this is another quote, a small effort, eine geringe Anstrengung des Geistes. In other words, pointing out the untruth and the injustice of the whole is necessary, but insufficient, since it does not change a thing about the hold this untruth or shine has on us. And this is a thought that is also pretty prominent in Ljubljana thinking. This is a provocative and challenging thesis about the essential limitation of ideology critique that, to me at least, seems a constitutive element of critical theory, of Frankfurt thinking, uh, thought and relation to this topos. It is also, I think, a commentary about the essential limitation of philosophy of thought reaching its limit in fully grasping, let alone educating, let alone liberating social reality, political subjects, human beings. One might read this in a pessimistic way, as an expression of Adorno's negativism, but one could also read this in an affirmative way, I think. The study and the critique of ideology will be a task for, but it will also exceed philosophy. Its horizon will have to be a form of political and social action, philosophy or thinking or theory cannot master or command. Pretending to do so would turn philosophy itself into the ultimate ideology. Philosophy's powerlessness, its Ohnmacht, is its dignity and its power. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Um, I think there was um, a lot of interesting overlap in the description, I think, uh, that were given. Uh, we heard from Rainer um, the problem or the description of uh, the normative inversion or the perversion of reason which justifies the unjustifiable. Uh, Mladen emphasized the move into uh, the obscenity in public discourse. Um, that is sort of, as Slavoj pointed out, um, um, reliant on, on an operational fetishistic disavowal. We heard from uh, Regina how this can manifest as our reality being structured as through something that's true and false at the very same time. Um, Alenka, I think, um, um, indicated that this is a specific way of naturalization which might be 
breakable, maybe in moments where one is actually anxious um, to speak. Um, and um, 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 I think um, Martin clearly indicated that there is still a massive potential to the structural transformation of the public sphere that, that might do something to the very status from which we articulate uh, the positions. So there is sufficient overlap. I would be interested to give you all um, the chance, I mean, not all, but some who want um, the chance to respond and take up elements to say something about the nuances or what aspects I think your perspective might highlight or give us to see uh, about the contemporary crisis, which you all spoke to, the contemporary crisis but which manifests in forms of new forms of authoritarianism, populism, um, a decay of, let's say, the public space um, of reason itself. So um, whoever wants to go first, I... Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Very short. Just three small points. First, dogma was mentioned. Can I provoke you with a gr stupid statement? I think we need one sign of progress is good progressive dogmaticism. It's not a cheap paradox. By this, I mean that certain things are simply accepted as totally unacceptable. For example, I wouldn't like to live in a society where we would have to debate endlessly, can we torture people or not? Can women be raped or not? I want to live in a society where somebody who advocates this is dismissed as a bad joke or stupid and so on. And unfortunately, I'm not here talking emptily. Both these topics are now, at least in the United States, again topics of legitimate debate. Some total idiot from some Bible Belt country. Uh, I'm, it's so obscene, I will not be vulgar, I'm even ashamed to say this. He made this argument. There is, I simplify, basically no rape. Be because if a woman doesn't get sorry for vulgarity, excited, you cannot penetrate her. So if you can do a rape, she in some sense consented. And I'm ashamed even to debate with this. So you see what I mean by good dogmaticism, not dogma, dogma, but progress is also that some things are out of the, are out of the question. Second, I agree with your uh, uh, Frankfurter side, <laughs> the actuality of many, not just that 54 Adorno, but even, when was it? Maybe, Rainer, you know better, was it 36, 7? Uh, something about uh, psychische structure, the fascist propaganda, or something like that, where, apart from some, you pointed out, problematic things, he says something very important. He sees it very clearly. I am against patriarchal society, believe me, totally. I mean, my God, imagine me with all my nervous tics. Can you imagine me as a patriarchal authority? So I'm not that. But he makes it very clearly that the new, let's call them totalitarian leaders, they are different, but nonetheless, Hitler, Stalin, they are not paternal figures. And he makes this, uh, he makes this, uh, very clear, uh, 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 ecology, I will be very clear. ecology. You know what's the problem, that ecology today, yes, we all hail it, is also so interpenetrated by Altax ideology. For example, I always mistrusted this personal Iberich culpabilization. Who are you to criticize society? Did you recycle all? Coca-Cola cans, did you put all the paper aside? This is a, such a dirty operation, it, pre, it basically prohibits system analysis, making you personally responsible. Se my last point, don't be afraid. Uh, 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 we, the most tragic thing for me today is that we live in an era of what I call unholy alliances. You know what may, made me almost cry? You remember Uganda a couple of months ago? A, uh, 
accepted with almost total majority the strictest law against homosexuality. If you are caught doing that, you can get death penalty. But you know how they formulated it? I checked it up as struggle against Western imperialism and colonialism. That's what makes me sad. And just one more thing. Can you, you already answered me, Rainer, but I think we Lacanians also have our own, and I expect from you, problems, but they <laughs> could have done it. What bothers me a little bit with the Frankfurt School tradition, and I totally understand the circumstances. It was a difficult situation. They didn't want to appear as playing the Western Cold War game, but where, why didn't they develop a systematic critique of so-called Stalinism? Because I think Stalinism, much more than fascism, is a case of dialectic der Aufklärung. It started as Aufklärung, it ended up in the uh, catastrophe. And the last tasteless metaphor, if you want to see the madness we live in today, I use this in one comment, maybe you know it. I was studying uh, two, three months ago how Nazis were torturing prisoners. And I learned that they had some testicle crackers made industrially. So I say, so that I will not be accused of lying, uh, inventing, let's check it. I put in Google testicle crackers. I got 15 companies making them from masochists. The highest was $15,000 with gold on it, with needles to prick you and Maybe this is the problem with many of us, cancel culture and so on. Instead of, as you pointed out, in a broad way, deploying some kind of alternative, we, especially in Europe, more and more are doing this even at a global level. More than proposing a uh, realist but radical alternatives, we enjoy putting needles into our testicles. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I will not speak again. Did you still read your generation, Vinetu Karl May? You know, at the end, Vinetu says, how ich habe gesprochen. That's what I'm saying now. Thank you. <laughs> Rainer. <laughs> Well, I want to, I don't, I don't, we, we talked about the question of, of um, a, an analysis of a Stalinist society uh, on the way, mm. on the way over here by the Frankfurt School. I think, I think you find, you find a lot of tools and conceptual I possibilities yeah. Yeah. for analyzing that dialectic uh, of enlightenment, but I think uh, the Frankfurters, um, that's just an explanation, not, a, not an excuse. The Frankfurters were aware of the Zeitkern yeah. in which you do theory. Uh, and I think the Cold War situation uh, in the uh, 50s made them on the one hand be quite outspoken and quite firm on um, uh, Stalinism. Uh, and I remember lots of stories that Habermas told me about the relation to Ernst Bloch and others, um, but they did not uh, develop a theory of what at the time Hannah Arendt and many others did, a theory of totalitarian society, which would be applicable to fascism uh, and uh, Stalinism. I think they were careful uh, that this could be uh, interpreted as a, uh, a radical critique of socialist ideas. Um, being perverted into, uh, into their opposite, such that these ideas themselves were thrown uh, to, into the uh, waste basket of history. But that's just a, um, a speculation. I, w I actually wanted to highlight two things. We were all defending ideology critique uh, as a possibility and a necessity with uh, Alenka um, reminding us that if you believe it is necessary, you're not yet 
there to explain how it is possible. And, uh, and I wanted to highlight uh, a few difficulties here. I think many of us um, have uh, stressed that ideologies, if they are successful, constitute to a good part and extent, and I, say, I don't say completely, otherwise we, couldn't, we could never be critical of it, but they constitute what Hegel calls second nature. And so, coming, gaining a critical distance toward ideologies is gaining a critical distance to a lot of things you grew up with, hold dearly, think is natural, essential, important. And so we have to be aware that it's very simple to say, oh, go home and do some ideology critique. Uh, but there's a lot of things uh, you need to question, and you need to question about, uh, about yourself. I think we are in a period where certain assumptions about um, uh, ethnicity, about gender, and so on, are being subverted, and you see how many of your beliefs that you thought at some time had been critically tested were reproducing stereotypes you were not aware of. So that's one difficulty. The other difficulty is, I think many of us um, used um, notions of reason, the public uh, use of reason, um, and, and so, so ideology critique seems to be a rationalist enterprise. It isn't just pitting some values against their deformation in reality. You also need to know which of the values in a society are actually rationally worth defending, right? You can't just take certain principles and values at, at face value. You have to say something about why they are the right, the right um, principles. So I think we, we were aiming, and that's a question I want to pose to the panel, toward a pretty rationalist um, uh, program. And I'm interested to hear what Lacan and the great interpretations of Lacan that have been developed in the Ljubljana School tell us about that, uh, about that possibility. Um, because um, the rationalist program assumes that at one point you can really um, um, use reason as the instrument to look through the false concepts we grew up with. If you are a bit more skeptical about looking through, uh, this uh, program might uh, not be as easily realizable as some of the programmatic speeches um, make seem. So uh, that would be a question uh, between us. I mean, because it's a direct question, that I, I'll ask. Um, well, yeah. Later. Okay. No. no you go, go ahead. No. Go go ahead. Home. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. Uh, just perhaps two very quick rem uh, remarks or responses to this. I mean, first of all, uh, obviously, the Lacanian perspective. If exposes uh, this divide between uh, reason and some un unrational passions and drives as precisely untenable. That this is not something that you can, a divide that you can make, and that this divide itself is already, let's say, ideological in the sense that we were discussing before. And by the way, I have a stu Iranian students who coined this very interesting uh, phrase namely um, one unites into two. There are certain divisions which are needed precisely for some kind of a monolithic structure to be maintained. And these are four false divisions. And I think, and this came up in the uh, many of uh, the things that were said before, uh, what also Slava called, and I'm working on this question now recently of disavowal and this, uh, what we are dealing with here in this kind of strange obscurantist, it looks obscurantist, to believe that even that you know, but you still go on in all the more so if you know. Uh, what we are dealing he with here is not some kind of return of uh, deep suppressed passions. This is 
rather a kind of perverse form of reason. It's a perverse form of knowledge. So it's uh, here the, the, the two really meet. It's not that you can simply rationalize this away and so the, the more you try to do so, uh, the, the more perverse it gets actually in a way. So I think this is, uh, and perhaps then uh, Mladen I think can say more. I would just add one more thing in relationship to these ways in which we respond to all these crises that we were discussing. Um, that uh, there is this very, very important uh, hint or line uh, in Lacan uh, when he warns us in context of nightmares. You know, we often talk about nightmares, the Ukraine war, uh, what is uh, going on now in the Middle East, uh, COVID, whatever. Uh, these were all nightmares. Uh, and uh, his line is that actually when it comes to nightmares, we often tend to wake up in order to be able to continue to sleep. And I think a lot of commotion that takes place around this, a lot of excitement serves not really to address the real causes of these nightmares, but to very uh, superficially give the lip service to, oh, this is really a crisis, without even attempting to really address, let's say, the, the true fire within the fire. You know, like you have climate crisis is a very nice metaphorical and literal uh, case of this, you know, we have all these fires all around the world, but there is also this fire that continues uh, even when you are extinguishing, you attempt to, uh, these urgent fires, you try to extinguish them, but there is another fire going on, which is obviously the, the climate change. So, sorry. Yes, um, well, okay, okay, I can answer to some extent to this challenge, but I mean, it's, it's um, maybe an expected uh, kind of difference between us, or a uh, contentious point. Uh, and I would just first say that um, in 1966, Lacan gathered all his writings under this book, uh, great book Ecrit, and the writings were scattered. And in order to make a, a sort of package out of them, there is a text on the last page, uh, on the last uh, cover, no? back cover of the Ecrit. And uh, this text uh, starts off by w with a very problematic sentence that uh, one would have to read this uh, collection of uh, writings in order to realize that there is, a, is, there is there a question of one single debate, one single battle. And if we want to put a name on this, it recognizes itself as the Battle of the Enlightenment. So you know, this is strategically, uh, this is not very often quoted, but it is strategically absolutely a crucial point when he publishes all, all these books, he places them under the battle for the Enlightenment, under the battle for the Enlightenment against obscurantism, and obscurantism is there defined as the ego psychology. Huh? So the, 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 the ego psychology which uh, bet, put all these bets on the autonomous ego as a rational agent is actually seen by Lacan as, as, the, as the opponent, as, as the, the possible site of, of uh, um, irrationality, as it were. So there is a rationality on the part of the un unearthing uh, or listening to or giving voice to or giving space for the unconscious to be heard. Um, and uh, the second point, I would just uh, say that Lacan was, Freud was also the man of the Enlightenment. And Lacan was uh, quite like this, this uh, sentence by Freud, uh, which is in the uh, future of an illusion, I think, where, he, where Freud says, in a sort of naive, enlightenment way, the Stimme des Intellects is leiser, uh, the, the voice of the intellect is low, but it, it uh, persists till it's got a hearing. Uh, it, it will not go away, the, 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 the voice of the intellect. And Lacan's comment is that uh, well, Freud says the same thing about the unconscious desire, uh, that uh, it, it persists until it gets a hearing, the unconscious. And uh, so the alliance between the two, between the Enlightenment uh, uh, sort of belief, uh, optimistic Enlightenment belief in Freud, uh, and uh, this other side, the, 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 the moment of truth which is in, uh, contained in the unconscious and which, which is a precarious truth, it's an errant truth. Uh, so this alliance between the errant truth uh, and the universality of reason. This is, this is the point that, uh, th this is where I think psychoanalysis uh, 
stands when you go after this question. Uh, can one I just one, just, really, just one, uh, no, because it, it directly relates to what Narian said. I think the very important thing is precisely this, that it is not unconscious on one side and reason on the other, uh, reason and thinking or whatever, and unconscious just drives. I mean, the crucial uh, thing that Freud formulated was precisely that un the unconscious thinks, thinking goes there, not simply passions and drives. Mm -hmm. Thinking goes there, and we better listen to the thinking that goes there instead of just like, uh, yeah, explaining it away in some uh, other way. I will Sorry. really be incredibly short. <laughs> what I, I know you have some have affinities spoken. with Kant, but do you know that Lacan, in the same text, when he asks this stupid question, where in European thought is the starting moment of the movement which ends in psychoanalysis. He doesn't go into this bullshit Schopenhauer, he says Kant. And second thing, that's why if we were to have more time, you know, there is a unique, they don't say the same thing, but it's a magic moment of saying a similar thesis with other reasons, Kant avec Sada. You have Lacan's text, you have the famous chapter on Ulysses, or what, I think, one of the additions Juliet. to... Juliette. Hmm. Uh, yes, Juliet, sorry, yes. And I, through all my connections, while I was still linked there, uh, I, it's not sure if Lacan knew it or not, because the text was written in early 60s, but uh, 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 dialectic or Aufklärung was translated into French, I think in 59, around there. So this would be extremely productive. Sorry. I think, yeah, re that, Regina. Fits, that fits nicely, thank you. Um, also, um, Len and Alenka, they uh, brought in the um, uh, public space and uh, the communication and the free free uh, free uh, speech issue. And I'm interested also here when we talk about the uh, rationalist enterprise uh, when dealing with ideology about the language. Uh, as we, I mean, language is infused with power and ideology is also a form of communication systematically distorted. Uh, by powers. Um, we live in times in which there is a high possibility that an entire discursive system may be deformed. And um, power uh, interests act on that, act through language. Mm -hmm. It's uh, part of it. We think about filter bubbles, about hate speech, artificial intelligence, bots, and so on. So, and there is no, there is no meta language. Uh, we can refer to, right? And so in such a situation, it becomes also impossible that we may find out what are the, the norms, the principles we can rely on, because if language itself is distorted, then that becomes uh, a very problematic thing. And Adorno said, well, we have the art. Well, art tells us there's something and uh, what we may, how we can get out of it, or the negation, the pure negation of it. That's all true. But at some point, also the, um, uh, the, the not uh, I yet, the not consciousness, uh, need the unconsciousness need to be transferred into language. And we need to talk about what's fake news, uh, what's ideology. So how can we do that? What's left then? Hmm. And I think, in a way, what's left is also something like uh, like reason, the uh, negation of the real-world distortion uh, through a not, not distorted idea of, of reason. It's a kind of that negation, uh, the imminent critique uh, we all here seem to share in a way that brings us out of the ideology. And so that's also a question uh, to the other side <laughs> of maybe, the panel, maybe, if, you, if maybe, you would agree that at some maybe, point maybe, uh, just, the language... Yeah, uh, just one second. I, I want to give Martin the, the Sorry, uh, I want uh, to occasion to yes. also... Uh, Sorry. I agree on much of what is said, but I, I see one point really, really differently uh, ah. about, let's say, our tradition. This might be an interesting By our contrast. By Frankfurt tradition. Yeah. Because I would think, and drawing on this one text, which is a representative text of Adorno's, 
brings for me pr in the pretty clear focus that he was also arguing against a cognitivist, I don't say rationalist, a cognitivist conception of ideology. And this is what he was accusing his contemporaries of. Mannheim is his worst enemy here. He tries to say, if we think of ideologies as bodies of thought, of beliefs, assumptions, let's say cognitive elements, discursive elements, we only understand Weltanschauungen, but not ideologies. Mm. Ideologies are something else. They grip us, they grip the intellect, the mind, and the psyche in a different way. He wasn't very explicit how to spell out how this grip worked, but it's clear that he has a more Freudian background assumption that this will be a, a, a mechanism of psychic gratification. And this goes back to his own analysis of uh, fascist propaganda from the 30s and 40s, yeah. Slavoj was yeah. pointing at. So I see him of moving away from a cognitivist, idealist, conception of ideology that focuses on the content of the ideological, and therefore I see a congenial Verwandtschaft with Ljubljana and the Lacanian approach of thinking this through the psychoanalytic means, which, as you all now stated, is not irrationalist or anti-rationalist, but in a way has a different picture of how someone under the grip or in the spell of ideologies becomes what it is. And this will be also for me more a question of, let's say, subjectivation than of adopting a certain set of beliefs or a doctrine. And therefore, for Adorno, the old ideal, ideological systems like nationalism are in a way exhausted. And therefore, he has this weird thesis in 54 that maybe ideology critique is not so relevant anymore and has to be replaced by, complemented by other forms of theorizing, and by the way, mainly not by art, but by politics, by restructuring practices and, let's say, worldly realities. And therefore, he is, I think, arguing against a philosophical misunderstanding of what ideology could mean, not severing it from the rational or the reasonable, but not relying on the ideological fully operating on the cognitive plane. And this, for me, seems an important insight that, for me, is predating, by the way, some of the Lacanian <laughs> and uh, Ljubljana innovations from the 1980s and 90s. Can I, I, I just very, very quickly give... Rainer wanted to add a thing, and then you get to respond, and then I think I suggest we open up already. Yeah. Oh. To the people. Yes, of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I must tell you, we are places. here representatives <laughs> of the people. <laughs> we know better than you what you want. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Exa exactly. exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> since we, we may also have a bit of a dispute on the Frankfurt side, uh, ah, I think that... I think that... <laughs> I think that expected it. <laughs> sorry, can I? Um, I think that distinction between the cognitive and the uh, what is in the psyche mm -hmm. is an artificial distinction and here I'm with uh, uh, Alenka and and uh, and the others if ideology were not a force of subjectivation which constitutes us as I said in our thinking and feeling it wouldn't be as deep-seated as it is but if we had no chance to understand how it does that, that it, it colonizes our realm of justifications, and if we had no chance to distance ourselves from these justifications in a justifiable way by the use of reason, ideology critique wouldn't be possible, right? And so the whole enterprise is to understand how the discursive elements of, uh, of ideology form a unity between the effects, between our bodily experience and our thoughts about who we are, and to, and, and to denaturalize um, this, com this complex. And then to say, oh, there's, there's a cognitive I can address, a cognitive dimension I can address, an affective or unconscious one I can't address, I think would be a severe problem uh, for ideology critique. So when Adorno says the Ideologie ist Rechtfertigung, I think 
he means rechtfertigung is not just a simple cognitive yeah. like a mathematical formula right it's about what you have an investment in as justifiable and need to distance yourself from um, by understanding that it is not justifiable. So, so that's just a, 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 a uh, with the Ljubljana um, uh, school, an intervention not to distinguish intellect, uh, mind, and psyche as separate mm. aspects of where ideolo ideology is to be found. Okay. Very brief. Uh, to you, uh, uh, Regina, I deeply agree with what you pointed out. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the problem with language. Mm -hmm. But I think Hegel, don't ask me where, has a wonderful formula where he says thinking is in language against language. Yes. That's why very interesting. How wrong is this view of Hegel, total rationalist, blah, 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 but he needed word plays and this playful element of language. It was crucial for him. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere at some point, you know, he moved to Berlin because of money, I read. He really thought he will go to Amsterdam. And he was already writing letters to Dutch friends. Send me as many as good uh, uh, word, spiele, word plays as you can. Another thing to support you. You know that with Freud, you find the same shift as with Adorno. Till 1910, Freud believed in the immediate power of interpretation. You explain it, the system will, dis uh, the symptom will disappear. Then the true problems began when he had to abandon this. Sorry. <laughs> well, You're interpolated now. <laughs> you, Mladen, are interpolated into uh, subject now <laughs> to no, 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 go to okay, no, no, no. no, no, I mean, do, do the two want to, of you no. want to add anything? I mean, I suggest we have 15 minutes left, 13 minutes. Uh, we take a good few democracy. questions from, from the audience, yeah? Are you a good Stalinist? Did you distribute the questions? Uh, yes, of course, oh, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you have to speak up, I fear, but yeah, please do. John Horowitz, as you say, I didn't get the question, but the question of myself. The professors, the audience, um, I have a question to you. Do you think... You are all of us, I hope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mr. Shek, when uh, you mentioned in your first speech um, Winnetou and cancel culture, and what do you think, uh, do you believe that cancel culture is independent of ideological criticism, whether it exists or not, because there are some discussions about it? No, first, I, I will be really, uh, you have good no. points to say here. <laughs> first, I. Uh, <laughs> Let me point this out. When I criticize woke, cancel culture, and so on, trans, and so on, I totally identify with their goals. And even when I said something which provoked uh, some problems among the non-enlightenment in my speech three days, four days that ago, listen, I wrote literally hundreds of pages justifying that anti-Semitism is for me literally the absolute zero level of ideology. Because it means, that's the formula, there is in my society an inner antagonism. The way to disavow this antagonism is to project the cause on to, to put it very simple. But you know what are my problems here? I will really try to be brief. brief. First, uh, cancel culture, you know? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> of course, I am against racism, uh, 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 sexism, whatever. But I ask here, in the spirit of all of us, a practical question. How which people does it mobilize, in what sense does it mobilize them, and what makes me afraid is that, you know, recently in Philomach of Deutsch, they published a short text of mine from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Wittgenstein to cancel culture, where, you know, it's not just wovon man nicht sprechen kann, darüber muss man schweigen, it's also, uh, uh, Wittgenstein said, wovon man nicht sprechen kann, das 
zeigt sich. Und hier, Wittgenstein ist not an obscurantist of mystical experience of God. He takes beautiful, simple examples of dignity, for example. If I all the time emphasize that I have dignity, it's self-undermining. Dignity must be something that shows itself in how I act. And my problem with cancel culture is that it's lacking this positive dimension. Okay, it is uh, inclusion, blah, 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 but what it actually does, was zeigt sich dort, is exclusion, exclusion, exclusion. They should be excluded. Old Stalin is always for exclusion. But you get my point. That's my problem. Second one, and I will stop immediately. What's my problem with trans ideology? I <laughs> totally support the point that uh, sexual identity is not biologically determined. Lacan repeats this again and again and again. My point is just that I read many texts on it. They, what they oppose to biology quite often is they use the word feeling. I feel like a woman in the, or man, blah, blah. But you know, here Freud enters. Sorry. Uh, the Freud, incredibly actual Freud, which is today uh, obliterated of infantile sexuality. The message is that there is no direct passage, even if you are like me, a lazy cisgender cis man. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not a direct passage. I'm too lazy to play the trans games. I just, oh, I have a penis, let's be lazy, let's be men, you know. It's a very complex process, even for a man to become a man. Freud, Freudian question is not the stupid one, this pseudo-psychoanalysis, whatever you think about, uh, you think secretly about sex, you know. Freud's question is the opposite one. But what do you think when you are making love? And Freud's element is beautiful one. We never leave infantile sexuality fantasies behind. They remain all the time here as the fantasy support of actual sexuality, what we do. So you see, this is my stance here, totally for trans. But beware that sexual identity is not just a matter of feeling. If there is a lesson of Freud, is that you may feel one thing which may cover hatred and so on. I just want to bring uh, complexity into it. But nobody says so. Nobody says it's just a matter of feeling. Sorry. Nobody. Uh, do, do you read trans people? Yes. Uh, really? Because yes. I read many of them who all the time use the term feeling, and I was accused of just uh, 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 being an old white man who uh, didn't read any books uh, about uh, in, the last, uh, in the last 30 years, I'm sorry. I, at least in the public discourse, find again and again, you know what? I, w I will give you an example from my own country. It, it was so tragic, a man changed himself into a woman, he, she did it, all the operations necessary, and all the parents, friends supported him, then her. Then it's interesting what happened. This would be Lacanian big other, the importers of symbolic system. Then, at some point, he, she then got from state authorities the official document, now you are a woman, suicide on the same day. Uh, you read that? Okay, I agree with you. Then I agree with you. I, great. I have many trans friends and so on. The other thing where I disagree is sometimes they think, they claim that there is some kind of a universally perverse 
neutral sexuality, and then some of us become men, some women. I am here a Hegelian referring to Kierkegaard Mladen. He's a traitor. He, his book did not yet appear. You know, this is the most famous quote almost from Kierkegaard, quoting another Danish uh, comedian who said there are three types of humans, uh, officers, handmaids, and chimney sweepers. I think that, no, uh, it's Hegelian paradox, I will not go into it. No, there are, in empirically for necessary reasons, sexual difference is a traumatic cut, which is not binary, and which is why for me, and believe me or not, I'm very popular among some trans people who accept this, that, that, that uh, the only, the only, that apart from men and women, we have people who stand for gap difference as such. They are trans. Sorry. Do we have other reactions to exactly this or the first question from the panel? Um, otherwise, I would say we take a, at least a second question. Uh, yes, please. Now, at least we move from the right to the center, no? Yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to ask you all, how do you feel about the future? Are you pessimistic or optimistic? Because um, ideology critique, uh, like this is more um, of Zizek's theory, um, is at this point almost a cliche. Like um, you said, je sais bien me quand même. Quand même. Um, we we criticize it, but at the same time, how does it even change anything? <laughs> like, are you, do you even think uh, that the future will be better? And, um, <laughs> yeah. Bitte. Can we abstimmen? Voting. Uh, um, any, any immediate reactions to how it can will start. change? Yes, please. Yeah. Please. Uh, thank you uh, for this important question. Um, there, if you do ideology critique um, in a Hegelian sense, we talked about that, that you start with a negation of reality and then you transform, you know, uh, um, with the help of some conceptions like freedom, uh, the existing notion of freedom, say a neoliberal idea of freedom, into something else into an idea of freedom that you think uh, might be adequate with regard uh, to reality and the way you would like to get out of it. Then one needs to say ideology critique does only make sense if it happens in practice and changes something. So it's, it's linked to societal change. That that's why I would say ideology critique is very important nowadays, uh, but only if uh, it's, uh, it's linked with the idea that practice in which we live, which we uphold ourselves, is changing. Whether that will be successful or not remains to be seen, but it's, it's something everybody should do in a way. But will ideology critique foster and strengthen these practices, or is this unrelated? Exactly, that's the question. It can be uh, the case, for example, uh, that's why it's so complicated, uh, that, you, that ideology critique even stabilizes mm -hmm. the world in which we live in. For example, yeah. mm -hmm. if uh, you think about um, Wall Street, so there can be an, a, a critique on economy, which then even stabilizes the financialization uh, of our world. Um, and so that's part of it. But then one needs to take that in, uh, in account as well. Indeed, yes. Do the two. <laughs> I, yeah, well, I, please. I can say something. Well, yes. Um, what follows from what we are speaking about, and I gave a particularly gloomy uh, diagnosis of the present, what's, what's to be done, is there any way out? 
And, um, well, of course, the, on, on the Frankfurt side, let's say, there is uh, the question of normativity of reason and justification. Those were the big words that we, we were using uh, as the best instrument that we have, actually. And I completely agree with this. We should, we, we should, uh, we should pursue this line. But is it sufficient? Is it sufficient to just point to the normativity of reason as a, as a way that uh, could somehow present a way out of this deadlock? It's absolutely necessary, but is it sufficient? And I think it was uh, Alenka that actually spoke in slightly different language when she proposed uh, the word that would make a difference and open up a new possibilities and choices. Huh? This is the problem. It's not just uh, persisting with the, with the um, inherent normativity of reason. Of course we persist, of course. But um, the, the, the trick, of course, is to invent this uh, the statement, the word, the uh, type of discourse, which would actually make a difference and open new set of possibilities, huh? which would get out of this deadlock. How to do this is it's very difficult. You don't have a, a formula to give. But um, Alenka also used this, uh, I think, very useful formulation that the words are being used as emoticons. Uh, and this is very different from the previous situation of postmodernity, where we had the irony as the universal kind of uh, frame of mind. Uh, we are ironic to our identity, we are ironic to every word, every word can be turned around as an ironic uh, thing. And now there is the end of the age of irony, is it where? And we have this uh, hard line, the, word, the words being used as uh, magical tools. They designate precisely, uh, they, they, they work in a magic way of designation and being identified with what, what they designate. And this is why the, 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 this, all these problems by banning this actually also links with the question on, on, on cancel culture. And so the problem would be maybe, can we invent a good word as emoticon, <laughs> I mean, a good, there are bad, way, bad ways of using words as emoticons, but somehow the word which would, which would make a difference and would have this passionate attachment to, to intervene in the real. Okay, I'll stop there. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take, uh, to take this up because I think Mladen is right. Uh, reason is the only faculty of critique yeah. that we have that is reliable. But to transcend the given, after you have uh, deconstructed the false grounds on which we stand, um, you need other faculties like the imagination, uh, which uh, um, open up uh, thinking of different ways to live. You can then use reason to ask yourself whether these ideals, aims, and ideas can stand uh, rational scrutiny, but reason itself is in need of other faculties of the mind to construct such possibilities. A slight disagreement um, with Regina, um, where um, she presents ideology critique as a Hegelian enterprise. Now, th there are two alternatives to read Hegelian. For the classic Hegelian model, which is Hegel's model, reason unfolded in history so that the faculty of reason starts sometime and you are at a current stage which allows you in a particular historical culture which happened to be European uh, to understand which, what others could not understand, what a progressive idea is, and what a regressive idea is. Once you give up that notion of reason unfolding in history, you can still be an imminent critic. But the question that critical theory has to pose, namely, which of the principles and values imminent to a particular society are worth holding on to, and which not? Immanentism cannot answer, right? You, you, the, the question of which of the values and principles in a given society, whether the libertarian notion of freedom or a socialist notion of freedom has more going for it 
pointing to imminence doesn't do the trick. So that is why I think ideology critique, if it understands um, that the idea of reason unfolding in history, the large Hegel, Hegel assumption, is no longer part of, our, of what we can philosophically defend. You need a more radical notion of reason that isn't, isn't context-free, it isn't non-social, but it has to generate a critical distance toward what we think is imminent and progressive, because it may not be. And to say that these are the progressive ideas in a society and these are not, we need something more than a showing that they're imminent because imminence, as Adorno teaches us, can be completely foul. It can be, as Martin said, a complete Verblendungszusammenhang. Uh, and so I think the work of reason has to be, has to, well, be critical of imminence. Martin, Ma Martin first and then. Just to react again to the cancel culture question, for me, the term cancel culture is one of these emoticons or emojis. But I have to, f I have to say, for me, this is an emoticon or emoji completely controlled by the right. It condenses certain preconceptions and prejudices about certain groups that bear no resemblance to reality and therefore is used as a an ideological or manipulative instrument in certain discourses. The same, in my opinion, holds true about the idea, for the idea that the fight for trans rights has to do with feelings. This for me is also, let's say, um, a very, very problematic condensing of a very complex problematics that have a, a deeply psychological and psychoanalytic dimension that should not be condensed in this way. So this is again uh, Slavoj, as you hear. Therefore, for me, yeah, this was easy. Yeah, so if someone asking for signs of hope, I feel that this generation is politicizing some questions that seem to be questions of opinion, scientific findings, and have accepted that this is also a war going on and a struggle to be Fought. This, to me, is a sign of hope, and also certain forms of activism, because this is not just, a, as I said, a cognitive matter. In the climate crisis context, we know many, many things, but they have to come with forms of action, and in this generation, they do. This gives me some hope, not enough. I have actually... Um, I will directly relate uh, to, to what you said in relation to this question of future. Uh, I would uh, say something like this. Don't, uh, ex don't expect anything from the future. This is future we decide now. Act is if this is the future. That's, uh, and then whatever. <laughs> you can decide. <laughs> Briefly, let me basically elaborate your point. In my Slovene language and in French, I'm too stupid to know about others, they have two words for future, future and avenir. And I think that, as you said, the, the only correct statement today is no future. Because if you analyze this subtly, future means basically with some reforms, continuation of the same. Like, like, we will change a little bit of politics, a little bit more recyclic, and so on. Avenir is more radical, is what is to come. And here, I would like to return to Hegel. I'm here more Hegelian. Hegel, I think, is the most open thinker to future, or what will come, then you can imagine. Remember the famous forerunner, I think, of Rechtsphilosophy, where he says, uh, we leave future to whatever, empty the task of philosophy is to understand the way, the form of life, Gestalt, which is here, and which is already 
disintegrating. So the first thing, conclusion for me, either Hegel was a complete inconsistent idiot, which he wasn't, or this holds also for his Rechtsphilosophy. I don't think that what Hegel describes in his Rechtsphilosophy is, to put it naively, some in the future great forum and so on. Hegel was fully aware that what he is describing is something, let's say, a historical possibility which is already coming to an coming to an end. As it is clear in his, correct me, I think the last written text, this, uh, uh, this uh, against British reform bill, which is in incidentally not just a stupid reactionary text. If you read it in detail, Hegel ingeniously predicted the populist misuse of uh, universal, of uh, global democracy. So, that's Hegel. I think what we should learn from Hegel today, precisely when, as you said, Alenka, we, uh, the future will be what we are doing now. I think the greatest genius of Hegel is not in this cheap sense list der Vernunft. All the evils that happen, who knows, maybe they will serve some higher goal, and then you ask, what about uh, uh, Holocaust? And there are some idiots, not Jews, who said, well, it wasn't too bad, uh, uh, it created the state of Israel. No, this is not Hegel. Hegel, I think, had a tremendous sense of whenever a great new idea comes, to immediately focus on how things can go wrong. For example, Hegel would get, I think, an intellectual orgasm, sorry for this, of World War I. You know, it was an epoch of before, at least in Europe, not around the world, of, ex of, of uh, relative progress. You had Bismarck here, who even did some kind of a healthcare retirement and so on. And then out of nowhere, First World War. That would have been Hegel's topic all the time. See, beware of these dark options. And here maybe we agree what you said and others there, because I cannot <laughs> quote him now in detail, but when he nonetheless deals with the problem, okay, if, uh, if a thinking cannot think the future, and I think here Hegel is on the right side against Marx. Marx is for me still a little bit too theology, teleologist, you know. Although he knows maybe there will be a catastrophe, but the idea is think somehow, at least as an objective possibility, move, move towards uh, the future. Hegel, uh, Hegel is here much more cautious, although not empirically. Don't forget this. Hegel was a genius in concrete uh, predictions. In History of Philosophy, sorry, Philosophy of History, he says then, 1800 by, it's too early to talk about America and Russia. Next century will be theirs. So Hegel was no idiot, but I think today we are precisely in this situation as you described it. We cannot rely on any, uh, on any, on any, uh, on any, uh, on any teleology. Uh, just a concrete, to shock you, political proposal, nonetheless, maybe is the time for the left to stop this fascination with, you know, millions of people on the street, uh, demonstrations and so on. Many of my friends were crying when they saw two years ago, the 6th of January, you remember, the crowd invading the Congress. And they said, wait a minute, we should have been doing this. Sorry, we have to draw some consequences. And here I will go to the end to, to provoke you. 
if there ever was a postmodern, but in this caricatural sense, a relativist, cynical president is Trump. He may pretend to be a conservative, but Trump is the ultimate postmodernist in how he acts. While, now comes the provocation. Why I admire Bernie Sanders is that he is what? If there is a person who deserves to, the title to be representative of ordinary moral majority, it's him. Maybe we should make some very, very risky uh, steps in that direction. As to, I propose not to go into it, uh, because I'm involved then in polemics, I'm very well aware of what you, Martin, were saying, and I don't talk about uh, uh, all the theoretical complexity. I think that what interests me with trans, first, I'm unconditionally for... <laughs> sorry? Yeah, no, no, sorry. I will stop. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. I stopped. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you all for being here and thinking with us, and join me in thinking and th thanking and thanking those who did the thinking in a more outspoken way. You know, no, don't be afraid. What I'm really proud of, due to some incidents, we were.